Over the years, I've watched many movie and TV show adaptations of various book series, but the one that has recently rocked me to my core is The World of the Mortal Instruments by Cassandra Clare. The Mortal Instruments tells a tale of Nephilim, angel-human hybrids who are tasked to slay demons. I watched the movie with Lily Collins and Jamie Campbell Bauer, and while the movie may have missed the mark by not explaining some pretty critical details such as Jason Alex Parapetai connection, the invisibility and silencing runes that make the Shadow Hunters invisible to the mundanes, and Simon's early vampiric transformation, at the very least, from after having read the first novel, City of Bones, the movie followed the story of the first book a hell of a lot more closely than the show ever managed to. And here is why. The show switched around some pretty significant events and put them out of order because, let's be honest, it's freeform. You're going to almost expect that with any book to TV show adaptation that they do. But season one made a huge change that I do personally not agree with. The whole wedding between Alec Lightwood and Lydia Bronwell, yeah, that never happened in the first book, let alone any of the books. So why did so many consider the movie a failure but the show a success? Well, the show succeeded on certain levels. Even though the story wasn't authentic to the source material, it did succeed with its casting. Catherine McNamara was Clary, much like how Harry Shum Jr. was Magnus Bane, and Matthew Daddario was Alec Lightwood. Even Emerald Tulbia captured the sexiness and playful teasing of Isabel Lightwood, and the show expanded upon Luke Garraway's role by making him a New York City cop rather than having him own a bookstore as he did in both the book and the film. But the show did succeed with something else, the pairing of Malik, the romantic relationship between Alec Lightwood and Magnus Bane. For many fans of the Shadowhunters Chronicles, the romantic relationship between Magnus Bane and Alec Lightwood is simply beloved. It is considered sacred to many fans of the Shadow World. In the books, they eventually go on to get married and they adopt two children together and they are incredibly loving, caring parents. We see in the show how good Alec is with children in his interactions with the little warlock girl Madsy and how good he and Magnus are of being babysitters. But why Alec and Magnus specifically? Well, if you read the books or if you watched the movie or even the first season of Shadowhunters, you know Clary and Jace's love is complicated and that's putting it generously. Because in the books, they're led to them believing that they are siblings biologically because Jace's backstory is a doozy. He was born a Herondale, but was soon kidnapped as a baby by Valentine Morgenstern, Clary's biological father who used a glamour to disguise himself as Michael Wayland, who'd been the parapetite of Alec and Isabel's father, Robert, whom Valentine had murdered. Then Valentine staged his death as Michael Wayland, leaving Jace an orphan and in the care of the Lightwoods. And at the end of the City of Bones, he tells Clary and Jace that they are biological siblings, which is a bucket load of bullshit. Jace goes through at least three or four different last names, and for at least three books, Jace and Clary are forced to remain apart but they cannot deny how badly they want each other. It even gets to a point where Jace is willing to try for an incestuous relationship with Clary, which leaves her utterly repulsed. This repetition of Clary and Jace's strained relationship can truly become tiresome after a while, which is why the show sped things up and integrated various plot lines from the other books into the second season. But it well made up for the lack of faithfulness to the source material by expanding upon the romance between Alec and Magnus. Throughout season one, Alec remains closeted, and when he meets Magnus Bane for the first time, he is struck by the sight of this warlock who is over 
over-the-top androgynous and looks like a majestic version of Adam Lambert. And of course, this eventually builds up to the big kiss between Magnus and Alec at Alec's wedding to Lydia Bronwell, which as I said, was never something that happened in any of the books at all. Alec never ever in the books was willing to marry a woman and keep himself closeted and miserable to restore honor to his family's name. But the Malik kiss was one of the most satisfying moments of the whole show because you see Alec is finally willing to drop his walls down and he's allowing himself to be happy. And of course Robert and Maris claim that they do not have so much of an issue with their son being gay, but rather they have an issue with him falling in love with a downworlder because of their prejudicial views toward downworlders who all have demon blood. But Magnus Bane, the high warlock of Brooklyn, proves that your blood doesn't make you who you are. It's your choices and what you choose to do with what's been given to you. Yeah, take some advice, Jonathan Christopher Morgenstern. You look like you could use some help there. And Magnus and Alec's romance continues blossoming throughout the course of the show, counterbalancing each other and bringing forth some of the best sense of humor. Alec's dark, cynical, sarcastic sense of humor is balanced by Magnus's over-the-top androgyny and openness. And they prove time and time again that they would do anything for each other. Magnus even tells Alec that Alec had unlocked something within him and brought him a sense of contentment, something he hadn't had in a a long time. But what makes Alec and Magnus's relationship so lovable is how pure their love is. It honestly reminds me so much of the love story of Kurt Hummel and Blaine Anderson from Glee. And given that Harry Shum Jr. got his start on the show Glee, I don't find that to be a coincidence at all. Alec and Magnus truly love and support each other unconditionally. And their relationship is truly tested when Magnus sacrifices his warlock powers to save Alec and Jace, giving up his immortality and leaving him in a deep depression, which leads to him begging on his hands and knees to seek Lorenzo's powers and have them act as a magical transplant. And it is here that Alec knows he cannot live without Magnus, even going to Lorenzo and pleading with him to remove his magic from Magnus, knowing that if Magnus keeps using magic, he will die, and that's something Alec would never be able to bear. The pain on Matt Daddario's face in that scene. The tears that spill over as he pleads is some of the best acting I've seen anywhere. And does it help that his older sister is Alexandra Daddario, aka the OG live action Annabeth Chase? Yes. Yes it does. Overall, the pairing of Malik saved Shadowhunters, because without them, I'm not sure whether the show would have gone on for the duration it did. Nobody can deny the amazing chemistry between Matthew Daddario and Harry Shum Jr. was simply perfection, and the way their love story was built up is untouchable, and we'll never get another same-sex romance done nearly as well as this one had been done. They made Shadowhunters what it is, and fans of the Shadow World will continue to remember Malik as one of the best written relationships on the show, along with Clary and Jace and Izzy and Simon. Thank you all for watching. If you're brand new here, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you never miss my content, because soon enough, I plan on doing a video on Isabel Lightwood, aka one of the sexiest, most badass female characters I've ever come across in literature. Also be sure to leave a like on the video and comment down below. All links will be down below in the description per usual. God bless, happy viewing, and have a nice day. See ya!